In other news, the UK and Western allies are calling for de-escalation in the Middle East after reports Israel launched airstrikes against Iran. State media says three drones were shot down with explosions heard at an airbase near the city of Isfahan. No damage or injuries have been reported in the latest exchange. The strike is thought to be in response to last weekend's attack when Iran fired a barrage of drones and missiles at Israel. The British Medical Association is urging Rishi Sunak to avoid using hostile language on what he described as sick note culture. During a major speech, the Prime Minister said 850,000 more people are out of work since the pandemic and insists he's on a moral mission to fix the problem. The proposals, though, have been described as a full-on assault on disabled people. Rishi Sunak recognised he'll be accused of lacking compassion but insists the UK can't afford a spiralling increase in the welfare bill. We now spend £69 billion on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. And the Met Police has apologised for causing further offence with an earlier apology about an officer's use of the term openly Jewish to an anti-Semitism campaigner who was near a pro-Palestine march. A video clip posted on social media showed the moment Gideon Falter was threatened with arrest by police. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. The chief executive of Campaign Against Anti-Semitism was wearing a kippah skullcap when he was stopped from crossing a road near the demonstration in London last Saturday. An earlier apology suggested opponents of the marches must know their presence is provocative, but the force have now issued another statement apologising for the further offence this earlier apology caused. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's time for headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, taking you through tomorrow's top stories for the next hour. And I'm joined by Josh Howey. There he is. Look at that. And Damien Slash, who have both stuck to the strict maximum hair allowance on the show. I've I didn't taken wanna... it all this week, haven't you? Yeah. Well, I that's, didn't... that's baldism, and I don't, I don't like that. I Do you know what? That. I don't even like it. I, I had no joke tonight, and Josh said, go with the hair thing. It's not like me, but he sort of greenlit it. I but... said it was OK. I assume that you... So you've done what I... I'm not brave enough to do. You've gone. You've shaved it all off. Yeah. I'm. Cl I'm not even clinging on. It's, it's just sad. Really I've just what's admitted going the truth. You know. Yeah. But you yeah. get a lot of. Uh, truth. I'm a yeah. liar. I'm pretending. Uh, yours is sleek. Josh gets a lot of acting roles as sort of divorced men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 1970s porn stars is what I'm going. I mean, for. I did used to. I went for this look for a couple of <laughs> get years. Get the camera off my head! <laughs> How dare that you? That is discrimination. Oh my gosh! I'm calling HR. After yes. This. I'm actually a fan. I mean, of I went for it, but I, I looked a bit like the guy from the really wild show with the with the long wispy bits out the side. Mm. You know what? I don't know. It it, it worked. I think. I think it works the older you get, it does start to work more. Yes, it looks because you've got you've given up hope. You like Bruce yeah. Willis in his heyday. Let's uh, let's crack on and have a quick look at Saturday's front pages then. And the Daily Mail has benefits to be axed after year on the dole. The Times goes with Tories plan stamp duty cut. The mirror now the world waits on Iran. The telegraph, you are openly Jewish. We'll get into that story in a minute. The Express, 200,000 demand Dame Esther gets her dying wish. And the Daily Star, Ratzilla, which is about large rats. So those are the front pages. OK, so let's start with the Telegraph. And a Met police officer has accused a man of being openly Jewish. Why couldn't he just hide it like you, John? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you are openly Jewish. Now, uh, I'm Jewish. I, obviously, I, I haven't really talked about it much. No. Before. I found out today. I know, I just told you. <laughs> we were standing next to each other in the uh, cubicle. But I... Um, so this is a clip of, uh, of a Jewish man walking through central London, walking past the march, wanting to walk through the march, as is his right, as a human being, uh, as a Londoner, and being stopped by a policeman who's basically like, look, you're open... You're, you're Jewish, 
Uh, they'll see you're Jewish, and that could, well, that sort of antagonise the protesters here. The now, we've been told for six months that these protests, they're peace marches, and everybody's welcome, and it's got nothing... They're not anti-Semitic at all, even though there have been these horrible placards and chants for the genocide of Jews, and yet the police... A Jewish person rocks up, basically just wearing a yarmulke, and suddenly surrounded by police going, no, 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 you can't go here, because you might provoke people being openly Jewish. Yeah. And we've got a little clip... Oh. Yeah, yeah. You are quite openly Jewish. This is a pro Palestinian march. Right. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction to your presence. Yeah, I mean, you know it's you're insane. not living in a kind of multicultural utopia when you have to arrest <laughs> Jewish people to keep them safe. Yeah. I mean, something's not adding up there. And yes. it, the whole thing just. It just looks uh, like a bit of a mess. I kind of, I almost feel sorry for the police being in the position they are, being you know paid virtually nothing to the point where they, I mean, they've got top-down orders to, uh, you know, do certain things, and they've ended up getting themselves into this hideous um, optic situation. Mm. Mm. But it's more uh, than optics, isn't it? It's, to me, it's another branch of anarcho-tyranny. It's punishing the innocent. Because I saw a previous example where they were kind of wrestling a guy to the floor saying, you'll be arrested for your own good. Mm. And I said that's completely wrong. And people say to me, no, Nick, it's about pragmatism. They can't possibly arrest everyone. I'm like, no, no. If you're arresting the innocent instead of the criminals or potential criminals in case the violent mob attack them, that's obviously wrong. And now yeah. this is another level of it where it comes to... You're, you look Jewish, so you're going to... To antagonize a baying mob. Yeah. Well, you wait for what can you do? I suppose the argument is do you just wait for them to commit a crime and to try and attack him? Maybe you have to. Maybe he is, he well, is this just is a, taking this a is risk. It. This is the thing. There are other there are, there are people in that video being threatening towards Jews, and the, and, and the police just do nothing to that Jewish guy. And there are people there going, Oh, you and, what, and the police are not going, arrest that person, because if they did that, they would have the rest of the mob on top of them, and they just want to get to the end of the day, I get that. But they have a responsibility to protect people, to protect innocent people. Jews are, believe it or not, human as well. We should be allowed to walk around our city in peace. Next Saturday, Jews and, and allies, I'm going to be putting on my yarmulke. When I go to synagogue, I put on my yarmulke for the day. I'm going to put it on. I'm going to go... I'm going to have a walk through the city, as many Jews are. It's not a protest. It's not a march. It's just proving a point that we should be able to exist in the city that I was born, my home, and be safe. And that is the police to... Their job is to protect us, not to protect people ca calling for violence against us or even committing... Exactly. Violence. Well, you'll be arrested for your own good, Josh. That's the bizarre, bizarre thing. And you have to ask a question. I'm not saying ban marches, but if they believe that the people on these marches will be violent to the point where they're saying, we're going to have to arrest you to protect you, that does sort of raise a question about the nature of the marches, doesn't it? I mean... Well, I mean, this guy should have just been allowed to go about his life freely. And if anyone was violent or did anything moving towards that, then they should have been arrested. I mean, that's how yeah. it works. Yeah. You know, you, people go about their lives. If anyone breaks the rules, you arrest them. You don't just yeah. arrest everyone in, on the precaution. Otherwise, yeah. um, why don't we just... We'd have to arrest everybody who might be at risk of uh, some kind of, of triggering some, other people. Be some weird minority report. Well, I suppose you could say... You mentioned optics. The police are worried about the optics of a Jewish guy getting attacked at a march, but... Maybe, I don't know, but maybe he has to, he's taking that chance. I don't know, I don't know what to do. Well, he's just trying to exist in the city. Exactly, he'd just been exactly. to synagogue and he was walking through town. It's the madness. crazy thing is the police are even crazier is that they put out a statement today that was incredibly offensive and had to have deleted that and now put an out a statement to apologise for that statement. That does seem it to really... be their strategy, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. just do something terrible and infringe on people's rights to kind of protect yourself from this mob and then apologise for it afterwards. That seems yeah. to be the strategy. All right, well, it's a shocking story. We've got to move on, though. What is on the mirror, Damien? On the mirror, we have um, Now the World Waits on Iran. Calls for calm as Israel. Revenge strike sparks fears of all-out war. Now, this is a story about Israel essentially escalating a little bit further by striking back at Iran for the recent attack on them by Iran, which was, in fact, you know, a response to the attack on the what Syrian, the consulate in Syria. So, it but this one... The consulate, it was the building next door. But... Oh, the building next door. Right. Well, either way, I suppose it's like... Um, this does seem to be more of a, to me, a theatrical strike that was probably deliberately designed not to cause too much damage, but, uh, you know, kind of say, let off that safety valve and essentially de-escalate while escalating, which is, I guess, good for all of us if it means that World War III can be put on pause for another few months. That would be nice. Do you agree, Josh? I mean, when it broke live in the studio the other night and I had to cover it, the, the, the other attack, you know, with the drones, it, was, it felt like World War III. Then it seemed, oh, maybe it was overblown, maybe Iran were just saving face. But it is, obviously, I don't know... Well, it wasn't just drones. The drones were what started yeah, it. Yeah, and then the missiles over the top. ballistic missiles yeah, yeah. on top of that. 
um, and a seven-year-old uh, child was injured in Israel. That was the only injury. But the, the difference is here. Those were to attacking civilians indiscriminately. And if they had fallen and hit their target, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of people could have been killed. Israel retaliation was a targeted attack on a military base. There's the difference between the two. Uh, and then Iran uh, has said, oh, no, it didn't, nothing really happened, nothing got through, but there's footage that has emerged now of just a big explosion on a military base. So, obviously, the, the, the proof is uh, in the pudding, so to speak, in that Israel wanted to go, you know what, you attack us with 300 um, mm -hmm. missiles and nothing really happens, apart from, obviously, the child being hurt, but we'll attack you with three and we'll blow up your base. So, OK. But I think, is Netanyahu going a bit rogue here? Because the US have even said we were not involved in any offensive operations. They almost want to... It sounds like they're distancing themselves. Is he sort of getting ahead of what even the US would want, would want them to do? Well, he has to, because, uh, first of all, he has to... It's the Middle East. It's a different mentality. It's just about a show of strength. If there is no retaliation, then it's an emboldenment of bullies of Iran here. But the other thing is that, uh, first of all, America has, can say whatever it wants uh, in, you know, to the public. What they're saying behind closed doors is, is something different. And the threat is not existential to America. The threat from, the, uh, from Iran is existential to Israel. But yeah. is, Israel could have absolutely... I mean, they could have gone much further than this, couldn't yeah. they? No, no, they absolutely. Could've, could've it was done, a, but this yeah. could be the first step of, of proof. But the other thing you want to say is that the, the enemy is not the Iranian people. It is the Islamic Republic. That's the big difference. Okay, we, we got, so we're going to move on and quickly do. Sorry, Dan, we've got to quickly do the times before the break, uh, Josh. Okay, Tories plan stamp duty cut. This is uh, in the um, the, ne the Treasury has drawn up plans for the autumn statement, and this is going to be the big bribe to the British people to say, please vote Tories, please, or at least vote some of us, keep a few of us around. Uh, and the plan is to do that is by uh, cutting stamp duty from two hundred fifty thousand to three hundred thousand pound properties. That's not going to affect anybody. Inside the M25. <laughs> <laughs> so this true. Uh, no, you won't find a house for that inside. Or a flat or, or really anything. Nice. But so, it does yeah. seem as if the Tories are kind of maybe doing a U-turn on their, you know, zero seats policy they've been going, <laughs> going out for so far. You think this will get be the winning thing, the uh, stamp duty policy will pull it back from 14 years. Well, there, there was no from, from the last uh from the from the spring um uh, statement, there was nothing yeah, there was there was the, the, they didn't see a bounce back from anything there. So mm. it really is oh, it's too no. little, too late. And they've still got to build and do something about immigration. It's not really going to do much. All right, guys, the front page is dealt with, but coming up, is anxiety a disability? Halal mortgages are now a thing, and why you probably shouldn't film women on a night out. See you in a minute. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. The perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in, you know, very casual exchanges. Mm. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a... Uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be, and somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, the, what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time. You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking? Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like one I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that. But from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective, protective characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested uh, merely for quoting the Bible um, and without actually intending you know, anything beyond that. 
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Nick Dixon, still here with Josh Howie. There he is, and looking good again, and Damien Slash. All right, oh. let's get your... You no, I was just like, I was, in, I was admiring Damien's sort of... I'm going to try... It was a sort of royal... <laughs> have, you got, have you got bald envy? Uh, I don't know, you're looking pretty good. You're looking there it is again. Get that camera away! <laughs> <laughs> don't put that as a preset. Uh, oh, into like, yeah, they said, they said they'd saved it, which is good. We've got, always got that now, Josh, just so you know, we've always got that ready. Fortunately, my wife's uh, not watching, so <laughs> oh, she won't she, notice. Yeah, she never watches. Let's, let's do the times. And it turns out anxiety may not qualify as a disability. There goes my parking space, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anxiety may not qualify for disability benefits in Rishi Sunak's reforms. So this is a really big story. This is uh, something that would have to be dealt with by any government, and I just have to say, let's not make it about Tories and Labour or anybody, because we have a big problem here. We are spending 50 billion a year on sickness benefits. That's going to rise another 20 billion by the end of the decade, and a lot of that increase is mental health issues. How we, the, what Rishi Sunak is talking about is how we. Um, are going to basically judge whether, who, who genuinely has it and mm -hmm. who is playing the system. Now, let's just be real here. I'm a comic. I've been out there many years now. I've got lots of mates in different stratas of life. And some people I know play the system. OK? Mm -hmm. Now, that's not everybody, that's just some people. And there are loopholes, and a lot of people have realised now that they can get away and say, oh, I'm feeling a bit depressed, yeah. and get money and get their life paid for. And, yeah, and that's, that's a reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safer, yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, there is something in that. I mean, if, if I didn't come to work when I was anxious or depressed, I'd, I'd stay at home every day. What do you think, Tim? Well, uh, well, exactly. I mean, uh, I was wondering if existential dread came under yeah. this. Uh, or, <laughs> On we. Mm. Because, I mean, it's absolutely terrifying even being alive. So, yes. I mean, uh, how can you not be anxious? So, I mean, we have to kind of draw the distinction between the, the terror of existing and, of course, you know, maybe being so anxious that you can't actually work. But, mm. yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that we've got very kind of <laughs> blasé with uh, getting people on medication. There are financial incentives to do that, which uh, I think are driving it. And, you know, the, the, it's probably good to draw some kind of line between, you know, who is too anxious to work and who is anxious and, say, doesn't feel like it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's, I do think it's ironic coming from Rishi Sunak, who basically shut down the entire economy for two years and told everyone to stay at home and, uh, you know, over-medicated the population in a whole host of other ways to now be rolling it back. I mean, it's, uh, it's yeah. a little bit ironic. Yes, we've had lockdowns, we're over medicalized we have a lack of meaning a lack of incentives to work, many factors causing this, I think. Mm. There's a quite a strange bit from Sunak here. He says, there's nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. Well, Sounds like J.G. Ballard well, or something, or Blade well, Runner. That's to, <laughs> weirdly yeah, poetic. The, that's the way they're trying to sort of frame it, is we're doing it for your own good, we've got to mm. get you out. It's like you've got that truculent <laughs> teenager in their room. Right. But also he's saying it's a, we've run out it, of money. it's a moral mission. Let's, right. you know, let's... It's not a moral mission. It's there is a fairness here about the people who pay into the system and people who take from the system. But really, it, it's a financial mission. That's what it is. We have a limited amount of money. Yeah. The fear is that now, when I think of disabled people, I think of people with who are born with disabilities or have had accidents in their life, physical disabilities, and the fear would be that those people would not be uh, a allowed the benefits that they need and deserve to help them, mm -hmm. and it's going to people with these 
yeah. what you could call anxiety. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I want to make sure that people are cared for. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, okay. otherwise, just... And, you know. and you could have proper, obviously, mental conditions, but not, like you say, mild anxiety and so on. All right, let's do The Guardian. And Rishi Sunak has rejected an EU offer. I didn't even read the rest. I'm just like, get in, Damien. Well, this Hate is, yeah, um, Rishi Sunak has basically said no to the EU's offer to offer this... Um, uh, youth mobility scheme, which essentially would be a kind of uh, open borders for certain students who want to kind of, you know, swap places with some British students. And, I mean, the point should be made that Labour also turned this down as well, because it just, it's just probably not a good look to have a kind of mini-EU, <laughs> yeah. mini-Brexit reversal while the kind of, like, migration thing is completely out yeah. of control. So, Let's get rid of free movement, but we've got youth mobility. It's, it's like back under another name. Well, I think, but you say it's not a good look. That's the thing. It's, it's just a look. That's not the actual reality of it. The reality would be it's limited by... It involves visas. It has... People have to prove income and ability. So it isn't an actual open border thing at all. And it's sad because... It, having this scheme where young people can go to other countries and, and earn, it benefits us, it benefits... Uh, it benefits our youth going abroad. It benefits our economy, importing um, people coming over who could well, contribute that, uh, to a society. That, that, that's, that's, that's true. And I think the, the, the point they go on to make, both Labour and the Conservatives, is that, well, you know, we're just saying no to the EU's offer and actually we're still going to go to all the countries we want and offer this to them individually as sovereign nations, which, of course, is what we can always do whenever we want anyway. And the mm. EU's essentially tried to front-run uh, you know, people doing it individually, as they always do. Yeah, well, Joshua, you're in favour, but even a senior Labour MP has said it's a, a sugar rush, a fast-fix solution that would uh, be helpful, but the, an incoming Labour government would be hard to wean off, apparently. So. Well, you know, yeah, but that's, that's have a, sometimes you need a sugar fix. <laughs> well, that's yeah, true. Uh, Labour, also, <laughs> Labour also said that, uh, you know, this would be good because you could get workers in that they need for their green revolution. And so, again, they're saying, oh, great, we can get some workers. And, you know, why not? Why don't we train the people here to do those jobs instead of getting them in from the EU? OK. Why well, don't I have a really strong opinion on that one because it was too boring? Let's do the mail now, <laughs> even though it's important, with a story about halal mortgages. I think quite a few people would convert just to get a house at this point, but unfortunately, it's in Canada, Damien. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Trudeau announcing halal mortgages to help uh, Muslim Canadians get onto the property ladder. And that's, that's really the kind of crux of the story, that um, there are these halal mortgages which are mortgages in a different form that don't involve interest, whereby you can, you know, say, you buy into the property with the bank and then you rent to them, thereby paying off the property over time without the... That sounds uh, like a mortgage. It's, a lot, it's, it's actually a lot like a mortgage. It just doesn't have the word interest in it. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of way of making it halal, I suppose. But um, this does already exist, and you can already do this. I mean, any, all three of us could get a halal mortgage tomorrow if we wanted. I mean, anyone could do it. I didn't know about it, and I quite want one, actually. Yeah. It sounds like an I, easy personally don't, I don't see Josh doing it personally, but yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> Would you do it if the deal was good enough? That's not... How many stereotypes <laughs> are going to go for it? Well, mul multiple. Um, yeah, fair enough. But they actually work out to be more expensive, or they can work out to be more expensive because they yeah. are riskier. So this is the government essentially giving a guarantee, like they do in America, with uh, with their system there. But the, but the problem is when you start doing those, so acting when the government acts as a guarantor, it can drive up prices because mm. then people will take make bigger risks. Yeah, I always thought it was one of the best things about Islam was the, the lack of uh, interest. But, yeah, when I read up on this, I was like, hang on, so it effectively renders the buyer a tenant or saddles them with debt because they have a, a rent-to-own model. And so it's actually no better, as you say. It's just a, mm. a different structure for doing the same thing. So now I'm less convinced... Might not so you're not going to be a Muslim anymore. Well, you I'm you really and Andrew thinking... Tate are going to split on this issue, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm finally going to fall out with Andrew, yeah, sticking with the old Christianity thing. But I wouldn't mind the house as well. I mean, I think you've got a house, so you're all right. Well, flat. It'll, it'll never come up flat. Let's all calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if the interest rates on these things can change drastically or not, but right now, I mean, taking a mortgage out, you just never know what's going to happen. You don't know if your, mortgage, you know, your interest rates are going to shoot up randomly at any given time. That so... is true. It's, it sounds a little bit more secure to me. I mean, I'm, I am thinking of converting just to get one of these. All right. 
Fair and you don't actually have to. So, so, see, Josh not converting, you are. It's called balance, guys. We're yeah. perfectly regulated. Do you, do you watch us, Ofcom? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> check it out, Ofcom. Let's do the Guardian then. And women have been filled against their will on nights out. Now, if there's one thing women hate, it's attention, Josh. I'm sorry about that, Joe. I apologize <laughs> to the nation. Well, look, women urged to contact police over Manchester nightlife online videos. So, these videos have drunk young women. Scantily clad, am I allowed to say that nowadays? Yeah. Uh, f falling about outside of nightclubs and they're being secretly filmed and these videos are going online. And it's a tricky one because they're obviously in that state in public mm. to, in the first place. I'm not trying to... I guess I am victim blaming here. Yeah, you are. I am victim blaming. But, <laughs> but the point is that they're also... They're young, and we all do stupid things when we're young. And I'm just thinking now, if I had a count, if I if I'd been filmed being drunk and every stupid thing I did when I was drunk, yeah, I would not. I'd be here. We've got we've got some footage actually. <laughs> yeah. we, we're not deploying so, it. We're saving it. So the idea it. that yes, yeah, so the idea that them in their moment of of being rebelry mates and Abandoned. doing crazy things is somehow that's an indictment on them. It's like, no, you're young and you're stupid and you should be allowed to do that and get away with it and not have it recorded and sent to mm. be criticised by the incels of the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen these videos on, on TikTok sure, many times. And, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are all over TikTok right now. It's not that, mm. I mean, this, this story claims... You don't, you don't have to follow those accounts. Uh, I mean, but, yeah. but, uh, that's what I'm saying. There's so many of them. Right, you've It's possible to avoid them. OK. Uh, and when you type in young girls... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's... it's just the thing that comes <laughs> up! Well, I, I mean, I, I'm a, I am a TikToker myself, and TikTok okay. have claimed they've got rid of this stuff. You sure you but want to I, admit that in public? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean... Uh, He's smashing it, The old models have... Have, have collapsed, oh, I'm afraid, okay. and uh, we are the future. But no, <laughs> uh, they're still all over TikTok. You can go and search for them right now. They've done nothing. They're still there. And it is, I mean, there's just really no, there's no kind of like standing up uh, for this. It is just, it's just voyeurism. It's shot by one guy. It's all super voyeuristic. They are all drunk. And it's totally, it is completely inappropriate by any standard. You know, it's, it's creepy. It's just creepy. Mm. And I, I, <laughs> I mean, uh, this guy's probably going to go to jail, to be honest. Yes, I agree. It is creepy. <laughs> Anything like this, upskirting, all that kind of thing, voyeurism, disgusting. Yes, there's a, there's a slight point Josh is saying, but should they... Is it ideal to go out and get absolutely hammered and be in a kind of state? Probably not, but well, then again... Well, that's a separate issue, isn't a separate it? issue, yeah. I mean, it's like... Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if, if I went out wearing a thong and... You know, I was kind of in a in a gutter, lying on a kebab. If mm. you know, uh, Josh would film it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, fine. You know, if my friends were filming it, or if a random person was filming it and laughing, it's different. If someone's literally set up a camera outside to catch me in my thong. And that's his whole channel. That's yeah, just that's, creepy. That's very creepy. Damien yeah. Thong channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes. yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm on the I'm on the side of the the ladies in this one. I agree. All right, I'm a feminist now. Let's. That is part two, pretty much done. But coming up, Unilever ditches the woke nonsense. Queen Charlotte was apparently a person of colour, and Cambridge University is favouring private school pupils. Surprise! That last one is news, but all good. See you in a minute. Hi there, and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Sky is clearing overnight. Most places fine as we start the weekend with high pressure in charge. That high pressure moving in from the west. Still a bit of a chilly breeze from the north, but as high pressure moves in, skies are going to clear, winds are going to ease, and under lengthy clear skies and with light winds, temperatures will fall away. A few mist and fog patches possible for the likes of Northern Ireland and some frosty conditions as we begin the weekend. So gardeners beware. Temperatures in urban areas 3 to 5 Celsius but as low as minus 3 for the likes of Northern Ireland, Northwest England and North Wales. Temperatures though through Saturday morning will quickly rise because of the widespread sunny skies and it stays sunny towards the south and the west for much of the afternoon. However, it tends to turn cloudier further north with some outbreaks of light rain moving into northern Scotland where it will be fairly chilly and we've still got that breeze down the North Sea coast making it feel on the cool side. Warm in the sunshine elsewhere and another sunny day to come for Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, West Wales and southwest England on Sunday. Bright skies also into the southeast. Elsewhere, increasingly low cloud and some patchy rain and drizzle for Northern England and eastern Scotland. Monday brings further cloudy skies for many with some patchy rain, but it stays relatively cool.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Let's get straight into it with The Guardian. And Unilever is set to scale back its environmental and social pledges in favour of, wait for it, actually making money, Daniel. I know they're, they're, they've, they're kind of U-turning on their ESG uh, mandates, but, yes, Unilever is scaling back environmental and social pledges and basically saying, uh, unleash the plastic, because their <laughs> profits haven't been so good, they're firing workers, you know, they need to get growth, and everything they make, basically... It comes in plastic. I mean, they make bleach, they make dove, they make surf, and you know you can't put bleach in a in a brown paper bag. And uh, speak, they also speak for yourself. <laughs> well, you, you can try it, but it, it, they also make Ben and Jerry's, which is absolutely amazing. I didn't know that. Mm. And of course, Ben and Jerry's is the most woke uh, yes. kind of food product in existence, which constantly you know goes on about the no. environment. And it turns out you know that they are essentially owned by the big one of the biggest plastic producers in the world. So nothing they say has any leg to stand on, as usual. Yeah, Ben and Jerry's are the, are the most insufferable. It's like, let's talk about Israel. It's like, no, I'm trying to just eat, I'm trying to have escapism and become a beast. I don't want to think about politics. They're <laughs> awful, but it's so interesting, Josh, that so there's a guy called uh, Dr. Nima Parvini who believes that the woke is being put away, meaning that the kind of regime, whatever you call it, the powers that be, will kind of put away some of the most egregious examples of wokeness, annoying things like critical race theory, DEI, and then actually they'll just kind of tuck that away again and go, okay, that's, that hasn't worked, that's too costly, let's just get rid of that nonsense. It does seem like it's happening here. It does, although those two examples you gave isn't really what this article is about. It, this is more about their environmental concerns. It's environmental, but it's also the social, there's the diverse businesses. There was a pledge, they're dropping into... a promise to spend €2 billion Euros a year with diverse businesses. So, yeah, yeah. a little bit of that a as little, well. A little bit of that, yeah. Uh, businesses are about making money, about making profits. At the same time, there's not to say that, that the businesses should be running unchecked. And this was a... I guess this was a lot of virtue signalling to show that, look, we're good guys. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to help as well as they make yeah. their billions. Uh, yeah. yet... We love the environment, but you know what else we love? Plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a tricky So thought. they're still going <laughs> to cut the plastic, but, look, I think less plastic, I think we can agree is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, every, and they are going to be cutting more uh, Yeah, literally plastic. everybody hates plastic, don't they? I mean, e I even want more plastic. climate deniers love... Uh, sorry, hate plastic. So. Yeah. I want more because I'm so, like, I'm so beaten down by the annoying woke capitalism. I just want more plastic now. Just loads of plastic. Plastic mm. straws, come on, paper straws don't work. Uh, uh, really yeah, I mean, the pla the, 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 yeah. let's get into that nest of vipers of plastic <laughs> straws. I've been talking for three hours. But it's similar to what happened with <laughs> Boeing like... recently, with, uh, you know, Boeing essentially kind of had, had to also had to U-turn a lot of the... ESG initiatives, which yeah. had degraded the company to such an extent they ended up, you know, selling some of their IP to China. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's happening in a lot of companies, and I think a lot of them are seeing that the ESG mandates and the DEI policies that have come down from, say, Davos and uh, stakeholder capitalism just are destroying Western uh, productivity and companies. Yes. And it, it's, you're seeing it across the board. And, yes, they are going to put the work away for that reason because it's, maybe it's served its purpose, I don't know. But for whatever reason, uh, everything's shifting away from that now. 
Mm. Yep, I agree. It doesn't work. They're getting rid of it. Let's do the times. And turns out gender dysphoria and autism might be linked. Who knew, except for everyone on this channel, Josh? Yes, for a long, long time. Are autism and gender dysphoria linked? This professor thinks so. This professor is called Professor Michael Craig. Uh, he sat in at various sessions going on at the Tavistock Clinic, which is now closed, which was the uh, main gender treatment centre in the UK. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, basically, he, as he was in these sessions, because he also specialises in autism, he was like, wait a minute, about 40, 50% of these people who are being treated here look like they are also displaying the same symptoms of autism. So this has, this connection has been made for a long time. Uh, it's also been highlighted recently in the CAS report, more specifically, and... There, what this article is getting into is more some of the reasons why there's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation going on where they're like, we're talking about neurological differences. Is that is that connected to the neurological differences of thinking that you're a different sex? But it might also be uh, identified as certainly young with young girls, and that's gone up sort of, uh, I think, a hundredfold in the last 10 years of people, of young girls identifying as trans. Um... 5,000%. 5,000, 5, yeah, it, it's it's great. Well, 50 up to 5,000, yeah. It, anyway, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, meant, it's, it's pretty in, incredible. But what that might suggest is that if, they, if there's a good chunk of those that contingent is autistic, it's because of being able... The reaction to puberty and the, and the change that comes with that can be very difficult, for, particularly for autistic young teenage girls to deal with. And so that might push them into this idea that, oh, I'm actually a different Yes, and, that's, and there's more social acceptance with it at the moment. Go, go on. Well, I was just going to say, it it's, it's kind of seems like common sense, really. It's like um, there are so... I mean, we're not computers, right? There are so many <laughs> uh, nuances in how we, our brains develop, how our personalities develop, how our psyches develop. And you know, everyone uh, has the potential to have some neuro spiciness to, to some degree. And so whether it's autism or something else, it's like, surely it's the job of any medical professional or psychological professional to explore all of those things before you get to, uh, my eight-year-old is uh, absolutely right and I need to do what they say. Yeah, that's the same. And and another strange thing is this, this guy, Dr Lawson here, who says he claims that people with autism feel less compulsion to conform to societal norms. This frees us up to connect more readily with our true gender, which is a ludicrous reading of it. What's far more likely is they feel dissociated from their actual well, that part, body. Well, that doc is a separate... This is a different professor that, who yeah, says yeah, that. Who yeah, says and that, that professor is transgender themselves, so right. they're obviously using... The, they are acknowledging this uh, connection to autism, but they're trying to sort of push it in yes, their in direction their way, yeah. to push their ideology. But continuing on what you were saying, Damien, is, yes, the, the difference is that these children and these autistic people went in, and as the first professor says, Michael Craig, is that they were automatically just assumed to be trans instead of dealing with these symptoms of autism, and that led, of course, to puberty blockers and yeah. medicalisation and... and, and and that, and, and that is just off. astonishing, and that's why it's the you know the biggest medical scandal for a hundred years. Because yeah. you know, if if even one child who had autism ended up being you know treated with um, hormone, sorry, puberty blockers or something, that's an absolute travesty. You know, it's, yeah. it's terrible. Absolutely agreed. All right, let's do the Times and Cambridge University is accidentally favouring private school pupils. That must be a blow for them, Damien. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, Cambridge University's wider access scheme has been aiding private school pupils instead of what you would assume it would be helping, which would be, say, you know, kids from uh, uh, working-class backgrounds or from state schools. But it turns out that they've cut, some people have been kind of playing the system. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> some of the schools on the outreach email list or the, 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 the kind of list they were outreaching to turn out to be some of the, you know, poshest and most privileged schools in existence, including a school that they literally ride there on horses. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be how poor they are. That could be in sort of uh, can't afford a car. Uh, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Be in Ireland and yeah, that's like the horseshoe village, theory, isn't it? I mean, it, oh yeah, so, so rich you eventually so become rich. poor again. Yeah, but uh, yeah, included a, a Gordon Stoon, the King's alma mater, and an online school set up by Harrow. And of course, Cambridge actually aren't apologising for this. And it it seems like it's kind of a hack. It's like. They don't really want to outreach that much. Uh, again, a kind of U-turn from a more ESG-type uh, thinking mm. and a return to, no, we actually do just want the absolute most uh, elite and highly trained children we can source. Yes, that's and, what we should go back to. But... 
Well, yeah, and of course, in their minds, that that's that happens to be these schools. I mean. I think it's a bit of a shame, to be honest. Well, but yeah, independent schools are often likely to be better. Isn't it, isn't it as simple as that? What do you think, Josh? No, well, the, what it is is because the, the system is to identify schools where they have had less than five pupils who went to Cambridge. That's the idea. So <laughs> some public schools, believe it or not, are full of rich people who are quite thick. Mm, so I've I went heard. to one of those schools. Right, I didn't want to say. Yeah, and so there would be less than five people who've gone to Cambridge... And, of course, we were, all had a lot of privilege, but we were just stupid. I'm annoyed because I was the opposite. I went to a state comprehensive, got the third highest grade in the country, history yeah. A-level, never talk about it. No-one said go to Oxbridge. No, and just here we are it. now, but you're hosting and I'm not, so <laughs> maybe it'll work out. You've fallen to this level, Josh, and this is the highest <laughs> I could possibly go. That's the difference. Let's do this telegraph. And Queen Charlotte was allegedly a person of colour. Guess we can be proud of our wonderfully diverse history then, Josh. Oi, Queen Charlotte was person of colour. Museum claims in LGBT... Guide, this is the Royal Museums in Greenwich. The uh, word there to stress is museum. And they've got this kind of history trail and you listen to an audio book and there's this guy, uh, he's a homosexual historian, self-declared, I should say, uh, Christian Adore. I don't know if that's a, his real name. And he, uh, as they walk around, they see a, pic a bust of uh, Queen Charlotte, and she's like, yeah, uh, the insecure white boys writing history conveniently forgot that uh, actually she was the royal's first person of colour. And it's just not true. It's all based on, on someone who wrote something 50 years after she died, and they said, oh, she was born, and she looked when she was born as a baby, she looked like she could be. And, incidentally, that person happened to be a, a white boy. Oh yeah. yeah, so it's just kind of why weird. are they using the phrase "insecure white boys"? Who are these? Is it? Are you hiring racist children? This is a museum. You shouldn't hear the phrase "insecure white boy" in a museum, right? Mean, but, yes, it, and it unless it's the was. museum of idiocy. No, I'm, I'm quite insecure. But you, it's not very. I mean, do you really expect to hear? It? It's not very historical, is it? You you wouldn't hear Starkey coming out with that phrase, would yeah. you? But I mean, the, the, the interesting <laughs> later on, and then they the bi, they talk, she, the same person talking about the bisexuality of James the First uh, in its deliciously gay stories, and states that Charles II and he had a string of mysteries and said, <laughs> "Look how progressive he was." <laughs> now, he was a now, player. Now, on yeah, Tinder. it's like saying. This guy, another way to frame it would be he was abused his power to have all these effects. So they, they're framing it like, look at him, he was so progressive with his mistresses. H History's Andrew Tate. And, and feminists <laughs> would go, well, here's a guy basically picking whoever he wanted and abusing women. Yeah, so. I mean, this is, here's one little irony, though, about this, which I have to credit uh, Toby Young with, sadly, it's not mine, which is that... They want to say, these kind of people, woke people, want to say our history's terrible, decolonised, the empire was evil. At the same time, they want to say our history's always been full of immigration, full of diversity and LGBT. Yeah. It's like, well, then we don't need to decolonise. We've already done. Why would you want to get rid of that beautiful, diverse, rich history? You see the, the, the dilemma. Yeah, and the only structural racism I see is the idea from the left that, say, a, um, a black person could not, could not be inspired by or interested in a white person. Right. I mean, that to me is, is structural racism. If, if, you're, if you're rewriting history and, and ideas in, in that Marxist model, mm. uh, I mean, that's the complete antithesis to what Martin Luther King taught. Great point. Neo Marxist postmodernism. That is part three <laughs> obliterated. But coming up in the final section, why men take longer to get over breakups? Does fasting actually work? And would you give away £20 million to become a monk? Obviously not. See you in a minute. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I see what you've been saying at home. You're very <sighs> vexed about these China cyber attacks. Colin says, what the hell is our Secret Service doing? They've only just realised what China's up to. You just couldn't make it up. We could have told we you. Knew. <laughs> we knew. We're not surprised. So, quite uh... what, Colin, we agree with you. Quite why it's taken GCHQ or MI6 or whatever it is, MI5, it would be MI5, yeah. to know what's going on. And Rod has said, thank you, Rod, if you know how you vote, if they know how you vote, coupled with mass data held also on you, you do, do you not believe they can influence your decision-making process in any way. I'm not but sure. they won't know. I'm not sure they know how you they vote know because that. that's. That's that, not on record anyway, no, is it? It is not. Um, and Ken says these are only able to be carried out because of computers, internet, mobile phones, etc. It seems to me that these inventions are ruining our lives and therefore we were much safer and much happier without these inventions. There is a school of thought that would agree with that, Ken, very oh, much I so. I sort of often think it myself, really. Me I mean, too. I mean, I... The, the, the dark web. 
I mean, yeah. how many people have been murdered because of the dark web? You do wonder as Brianna, well. Brianna Jai. Yeah, you do wonder. I look at my kids' generation and I wonder whether they will grow up and have a complete rejection of all of this and they will just say, enough, because they will think we were all insane for having become so addicted to our phones. Mm. I wonder whether, as a generation after generation do, they will reject it. Wayne, blame Western governments for the rise of China. People were saying this 10 years ago and every country ignored it. That is a really good point, mm. Wayne, because we've taken Chinese investment and obviously our houses are full of items we well, bought from made and, in and China. And if you remember as well, we had to get them out of the 5G. Why are we? Had we to did. Get them out, get, literally extricate them. Yeah, from that us. was at least one thing I think they did quite well. Yeah. And Jan says if they've seen the electoral roll, what else have they been looking at? That's the threat to our democracy. They never do things by halves. I'm much more worried about my own government looking at what I do online, to be fair. What you said, go back, we said before, the electoral roll is a do public document which you can access if you go to your library. Mm. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument to... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners for the final section. Let's get into it with the Metro. And it takes men longer than women to get over a breakup. Is that because we actually have souls, Josh? You talk, you're in a woman here. What? Uh, well, I just... Uh, okay. It officially takes women, uh, men, longer t to get over a breakup. This is a terrifying story from sex expert Dr. Lee Moore Gottlieb. Uh, and the gist of it is, is that men are rubbish and women... Um, will put up with us for a certain amount of time and men will think that everything's all fine and then 60% of women will actually divorce men and then it's over for us. Because they're plotting, because it wasn't fine. They were planning their escape route. Yeah. Most divorces are initiated by women. I've watched all the videos on YouTube about yeah. this. And so this is... Damien, what do you think? Isn't this just classic? I mean, the men don't realise what's hit them. They get divorced, but the women have been plotting it for about eight, five years or something. Well, I, 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 you see it a lot and... I don't know, I see so many kind of videos, especially, again, on TikTok, of uh, you know, men who seem completely incapable of looking after themselves. They have this kind of... They kind of turn into big babies over time. And I'm not blaming men here. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons why it's harder for men after a divorce or something. Uh, you know, m men don't get the same access to their kids and stuff like that. Right. And uh, anyway, but... Well, their money. <laughs> but I, but my, my point is, uh, I, do, I do think men are... Uh, in our society, kind of, they get they get very comfortable. They they lose their edge. They they forget they forget to harness and maintain a healthy kind of masculinity within their relationships, and and they do end up coming out the other side. Uh, I think um, mm. very confused and lost. Seems very like anti-man. Talk, talk, talking about me there, I no. feel very seen. I'm, yeah, I'm Josh feels seen because he doesn't. He's forgotten how to look after himself. But come on, men. Most of divorces are initiated by women, right? Men, as you said, terrible uh, custody uh, laws stacked against men. They lose money. They can't see their kids. It's not men's fault, is it? Sure. Well, I'm not saying it's no. men's fault. I'm just saying men need to take more responsibility. It's yes. no one's, no, it's men, no need, one's men, fault. men need to step it's, up. It's, this is what we need to women. understand. This is what it says here. <laughs> the last thing here, women experience dissatisfaction more profoundly or more strongly. So blokes, we're just going to be like... If, 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 we, if no one says anything to us, we're just going to be like, oh, yeah, everything's good. We'll accept everything's fine. And then suddenly your level... wife turns around to you and says, oh, I've been unhappy for months, and right. you're like, what? You did, I, you know. We'll be like, of course, life's miserable. We've accepted a low <laughs> level unhappiness at all times. So the, yeah, the point is, any men out there who don't, who want to stay married. 
Just assume that it is something is wrong and step up your game. Precisely. And I, I'm talking to myself here. Mm. Well, that's what I, I'm game. talking to you as well. well. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's like pay more attention. Yeah. And you know, don't lose your edge. Make sure you make sure you look after yourself and and take responsibility. And and I, and I think you might get different results. And I'm, I'm just saying, take a little bit more responsibility. Keep your edge. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get wig. All right. Wig. Let's do the mail. And turns out some men are allergic to their own orgasms. That's about as unlucky as it gets, isn't it, David? Oh my God. This story. Yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you, could you be allergic to your own orgasm? Question mark. Study finds there's several different types of postcoital flu symptoms that strike men, and it doesn't have to be postcoital. This can also be, you know, self-love and, uh, or in fact, any form of orgasm, including having an orgasm in your sleep. Uh, and apparently, this is leaving some men. I mean, I, when I say some, I mean virtually none. Yes. Over 20 years, we're talking about 60. But these poor 60 men have ended up with uh, terrible flu symptoms, right. aches and pains, good. and uh, self loathing. And, uh... Good thing we're covering this important story. I mean, I've got a master's in modern literature, Josh. One of the symptoms is fatigue. <laughs> one I mean, I read this, I was like, I can't believe I'm one of the 60. Yeah, one of the symptoms is just difficulty concentrating. <laughs> that means you're just not listening anymore because you're kind of yeah, like, one happy, of, right? One of them now. was incoherent speech. I mean, this is. <laughs> The yeah, that's I've got it. Right. It, got it I've got it there. right now. <laughs> I had a good break. All right, because this goes out at 5 a.m., let's move on and do the times. And fasting is not a magical solution for weight loss, as we've both noticed, Josh. Yeah, you knew. Yeah, I've been doing this fasting on and off for the last two years. Yo yo diet. The audience will have seen me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is Josh okay? Oh, he definitely is again. Yeah. Fasting diet, uh, not magical solution for weight loss, study finds. And it seems so obvious, but it, the, so the point is, fasting in and of itself isn't going to, and it's obviously a bit of a fad thing, and you've got Rishi Sunak doing it for 36 hours a week and all of this. That's why he uses but the, the hammer the wrong way around. It works. Why does it work? Because you're eating less. It's that simple. <laughs> it's that simple. So it's easier to eat nothing than it is to sort of weigh up calories it's and look up. It's a technique to trick yourself to eat less. Exactly. But it and, does, it does it apparently works. have other health benefits in mice, so it may have other health benefits, but they're just talking about pure weight loss, Damien. No, well, no, and uh, blood pressure. Uh, yes, and so blood pressure. Uh, yes, oh. they're talking about just weight loss, and of course, there are a whole host of other benefits as well. And I think they're also talking about intermittent fasting rather than just, say, not eating for three weeks, because that definitely will uh, you know, take some pounds off. Yes, true. And, uh, but not for everyone. OK. <laughs> Should we do this other one quickly? Yeah. Yeah, let's do the star quickly. And a couple have given away their £20 million fortune to become monks. I'm not sure whether to be impressed or kind of annoyed, Damien. Well, there you go. It's, it's more of our horseshoe theory. They got so rich that they realised that, actually, you don't really need any money, and they became monks just like their kids. So they, all kind of, they were kind of, like, monk-pilled by their, <laughs> by monk their children. Pill. And they, nice. they decided to literally catapult some of their most prized possessions into their community. And I think that was how they gave them away. They, they chucked stuff them. over a bridge or something, and people were catching it. I mean, it's yeah. kind of annoying. Big TV. They, yeah, yeah. They better. My thought was they better be really good monks, because <laughs> otherwise you've just given away twenty minutes. What if you're a rubbish monk and you're like, yeah. I want the money back? And also yeah. they're married. <laughs> they're a married couple. Yeah. So they've got to walk around now, and they they have to survive off the generous generosity of other people. I mean. That's all well and good, and like, yeah, giving away generosity, but <clears throat> like, keep a million back. Yeah, just also, keep a million just oh, for rainy sh I, days. I bet you, I bet you a million pounds. There's, there's uh, some money tucked away. Some, yeah, I don't know. Like, or some assets or something. <laughs> the other thing is, if you knew that they're giving away twenty million, you'd be so annoyed. I'd deliberately not help them. You know what I mean? They, they, <laughs> they want my large yes just based on sort of my goodwill. I'd say, why didn't you give some to me? Yeah, or yeah. fund GB News, or <laughs> give us all money. Well, yeah, build another monastery, I don't know. You know. Yeah, build a build 20 million monasteries. All right, thanks, guys. The show is pretty much over, but let's have another quick look at Saturday's front pages. So, the Daily Mail has benefits to be axed after year on the dole. The Times, Tories plan stamp duty cut. Big election winner there. The Mirror, now the world waits on Iran. The Telegraph has, you are openly Jewish. The Express, 200,000 demand Dame Esther gets her dying wish. And the star, Ratzilla, which is a rat story, sadly, we didn't get the chance to discuss. That is pretty much it for tonight's show. Thanks to Josh and Damien. Headliners is back tomorrow at 11 p.m. with me, Leo and Lewis. And if you're watching at 5 a.m., then, of course, stay tuned for breakfast. But for now, it's pretty much good night or good morning and God bless. And also, catch us on YouTube. That's where I always watch. <laughs> <laughs> A brighter outlook with Box Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hi there and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Sky is clearing overnight, most places fine as we start the weekend with high pressure in charge. That high pressure moving in from the west. Still a bit of a chilly breeze from the north, but as high pressure moves in, skies are going to clear, winds are going to ease and under lengthy clear skies and with light winds temperatures will fall away. A few mist and fog patches possible for the likes of Northern Ireland and some frosty conditions as we begin the weekend. So gardeners beware. Temperatures in urban areas 3 to 5 Celsius but as low as minus 3 for the likes of Northern Ireland, North West England and North Wales. Temperatures though through Saturday morning will quickly rise because of the widespread sunny skies and it stays sunny towards the south and the west for much of the afternoon. However, it tends to turn cloudier further north with some outbreaks of light rain moving into northern Scotland where it will be fairly chilly and we've still got that breeze down the North Sea coast making it feel on the cool side. Warm in the sunshine elsewhere and another sunny day to come for Northern Ireland, parts of southwest Scotland, West Wales and southwest England on Sunday. Bright skies also into the southeast. Elsewhere, increasingly low cloud and some patchy rain and drizzle for Northern England and eastern Scotland. Monday brings further cloudy skies for many with some patchy rain, but it stays relatively... That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Anderson's Real World. We've got a cracking lineup tonight. We've got Andy McDonald, trade unionist. He's back on the show for about the tenth time. Also, for the first time, we've got Free Speech Union director Jan McBarish. Political commentator Chloe Dobbs, she's on the show for the second time. We've got self-made millionaire, successful businesswoman Kate Stewart. And race.